Uh, all right, so um, here we go. Unit one, chapter one. So this is 10 to 14% of the exam. Um, let's go through it. The cool thing is that we've worked backwards through our reviews. So we've actually covered this, um, you know, probably in its entirety uh, already, but it's just one more thing that we'll do right before our exams. The psychology, the definition of it, two things, all right? Oh, study of the uh, mental processes um, and behavior. So that's what psychology is. Um, and, you know, early on, they didn't quite know what it was. You know, it starts coming to light kind of in the late 1800s. Um, and people were kind of confused. They knew that the brain did something and it had, you know, controlled you know, vital functions because when the brain was damaged um, greatly, you, you died just like the heart. Um, so, you know, that was something that we knew inherently, but we didn't know much about what the brain actually did. Uh, and psychology is kind of the journey of that. Um, so the first Western thinker to think of this would be Aristotle. Um, so he wrote this book called De Anima, um, and you know that we would call it a, a, a treatise, which is just an essay uh, on psychology. So he mentioned topics of senses, perception, memory, thinking, and motivation, which are all huge parts of this class. Um, so he kind of starts the the process of thinking about those things. Then uh, Descartes. Um, so he comes up with this thing called interactive dualism. So the, the idea that the mind and body were separate um, uh, and, uh, you know, it interacted with each other to produce sensations, emotions, and other conscious experiences. Uh, so he is very, you know, he's known for this quote, I think, therefore I am, meaning that, you know, okay, I'm conscious, meaning I am alive. I, you know, I, you know, that's what's going on here. Um, I can think about my present situation and past situations and future situations, meaning that I do exist. Um, so, uh, da, da, da. all right, so huge thing, nature versus nurture. Um, you know, that's the big question, kind of the overarching question that we get throughout the entire psychology course, um, which basically means, what is it? Is it genetics or is it our environment and how we've grown up and what we've experienced? And the answer is both. Um, so, you know, hopefully you've seen that through this course. Uh, physiology, that's kind of just the, you know, the branch of biology that studies the functions of living organisms, um, specifically like the body. Um, so, you know, this is how this kind of all started off. Um, you know, people would, you know, what is it? Oh my goodness. I forgot the term. What is it whenever they uh, dissect you after death? Autopsy. Yes, autopsy. Oh my gosh. Doing autopsy is pretty much the only you know, way we could find out the you know, specific things in the brain, what they look like and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, Wilhelm Wundt, the father, the baby daddy of psychology. So he comes up with the first psychology laboratory. And what you know about psychology now is that it is based in science, the scientific method. <clears throat> so um, he comes up with this in Leipzig, Germany, um, you know, wrote the first um, psychology book, so Principles of Physiological Psychology, um, and, you know, kind of started this whole process of, you know, experimental psychology. Um, so he did an experiment that uh, tried to measure how long a person took to consciously detect the sight and sound of a bell being struck. Um, so yeah, uh, Wilhelm Wundt, uh, psychology's baby daddy. <clears throat> All right, Edward B. Titchener, he comes up with this thing called structuralism. Uh, so that's kind of what we need to know about him. Now, what is structuralism? It's kind of imagining that the brain and the mind had these different structures that we access at different times. So, um, imagine, you know, think about cognition, right? So memory, language, perception, um, you know, any, anything like that, 
we would imagine them being structural things in the mind and we would access them at different points to think. Um, <clears throat> Titchener and structuralism use this thing called introspection. And so introspection is the examination or observation of one's own mental and emotional processes. Uh, and it had significant limitations because it really depended on what the subject was feeling in the moment. So you, know, you, could, you could be shown the same stimulus five days in a row and have some different answers about that stimulus depending on how you feel about it. Um, so it was subjective and it wasn't that scientifical. So structuralism really wasn't based in science. Um, some structuralists um, that uh, we cover that were students of Titchener, we have Margaret Floyd Washburn. So what do you need to know about her? Um, she was the first American woman to earn a PhD in psychology um, and you know, that's what we have to know about her. Uh, so she became the second woman elected president of the American Psychological Association. We're gonna cover the first here in a second, um, but Margaret, Margaret Floyd Washburn. So she was the first one to get a PhD. So um, I'm trying to think of a good way to remember that for you guys. Um, Hmm. Probably Floyd. I'd go with like first PhD. So it's kind of like both f sounds. I don't know. That's how I would try to remember it like that. <clears throat> William James, um, the father of another dead uh, perspective in psychology, which happens to be uh, functionalism. Okay. So uh, he kind of brought psychology to the United States, um, you know, um, really, really, really loved evolution. He was based in that. Um, so functionalism stressed the importance of how behavior functions to allow people and animals to adapt to their environments, which we understand in psychology, which is really important because we've adapted to survive and that's what we're dealing with in this, in this world today. Um, functionalists had very different ideas about the nature of consciousness and how it should be studied. Uh, rather than trying to identify the essential structures of consciousness, um, William James and functionalists decided and saw consciousness as an ongoing stream of mental activity that shifts and changes with an ever flowing state, uh, which we've talked about before in our reviews before that. Uh, students of functionalism, so we have G. Stanley Hall. Um, so um, very interesting guy here, but um, he is, uh, you know, the first person to found a laboratory of psychology in the United States at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he founded the APA, okay, so the American Psychological Association. He was the first president, um, and that has grown to, you know, a huge organization, um, you know, and, and recently we've had a, a president of the APA at UNCW, so. Francis C. Sumner was a um, student of functionalism. Um, so he was the first uh, African-American to receive a PhD in psychology. Um, and so he went on to teach a, another African-American uh, along with uh, this guy's wife.
โอ้Me? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh FBC man. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, oh really? Cool. Church, the church league or no? Yeah. Still play first Baptist? Yeah. But they were they were redoing those fields, I guess, right? Yeah, I remember seeing that. Ruined it. I'll send you an email just to remind you about three. Okay, I will. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, all right, so Francis C. Sumner, um, first African American to re receive his PhD. Now, he actually had a student called Kenneth Bancroft Clark, and he was an uh, African American as well. And him and his wife did massive amounts of research on discrimination and all that kind of stuff, and actually brought it to the civil rights movement and the civil rights. Act and um, you know brought it to the Supreme Court of the United States and used research uh, to fight discrimination and to end segregation, which is really cool. Um, you know their uh, their studies on psychology ended up doing something like that. Uh, all right, so Mary Whitten Calkins. So uh, this is who you would possibly get confused with, uh, Margaret Floyd Washburn. So. Mary Whitten Calkins never got her PhD because she, you know, pretty much studied at Harvard and they refused to give any PhDs or any doctorates or any, you know, certificate or, you know, diploma to anybody who wasn't a male. So um, she was uh, left off that and uh, still, you know, thrived in the world of psychology. Um, so she created her own laboratory uh, in um, you know, at Wellesley College, uh, and she was very pivotal, pivotal in um, the study of um, ah. Oh, why can't I remember this? My brain is like almost not working at all today. I don't know what's going on. Uh, dreams, memory, and personality. Um, so uh, what you have to know about her really is one thing, and she was the first woman, okay, to be the head of the APA. She can't get confused with Margaret Floyd Washburn, first woman to get her PhD, uh, and Mary Whitten Calkins, the first woman to be the head of the APA. Sorry, my brain just exploded. Yep, Freud, I'm not gonna talk about him that much because we've talked about him so much already. So psychoanalysis uh, is his baby, uh, which is the study of the unconscious mind and early childhood experiences and how they affect you as an adult. Uh, he comes up with you know a model of personality which has different levels and different parts. So the levels are consciousness, pre-consciousness, and unconscious. And the parts are ego, superego, and id. So ego, the planning part of your brain, it's, all, it's kind of based on reality a little bit. Superego, that moralistic voice in your head, don't do that, that's not right, that's not nice. Um, that's the superego. And the id is give me what I want and give it to me right now. Um, and all of those are parts of the mind. The levels are the conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious. Um, behaviorism, we've talked about a lot. It's really based in learning and uh, the principles of learning. Uh, and that's how we acquire behaviors. 
Um, so some big time, you know, contributors to behaviorism is Pavlov. He did Pavlov's dogs. Um, you know, hopefully you've put this into your mind a little bit. The UCS, right? Uh, the, the UCR, uh, the CS and the CR. Uh, so the condition stimulus, the condition response. Remember that the response is going to be the same every single time. Uh, John B. Watson, uh, he was a little Albert experiment guy. He did the same thing that Pavlov did, except the babies. It was considered unethical. Um, B.F. Skinner, he comes up with this stuff called operant conditioning, where you operate in the environment to get what you want. And what you want is a particular consequence. Um, so, you know, he created the Skinner box with uh, this little rat pressing a lever to get food when the light is green. And when the light is red and the rat presses the lever, it gets shocked. And guess what? The rat learns really quickly. Um, humanistic psychology, I've told you this is my favorite. Um, so it's all about reaching your human potential. Some humanistic psychologists are Carl Rogers, uh, who comes up with unconditional positive regard, client-centered therapy. And then we have Abraham Maslow, who comes up with the hierarchy of needs. Remember, at the bottom levels of the hierarchy of need, um, is physiological stuff, what you need to actually be alive, and then safety things, what can keep you safe and alive longer, and then love and belonging, which is kind of like the social needs category, and then personal needs, like psychological needs are above that, and then finally, if you get all of those things, and you can kind of jump around the middle three levels, um, you get to be self-actualized, which is, you know, reaching your full potential and being able to help others reach theirs. All right, contemporary psychology. Um, so let's just go through these perspectives. Biological perspective, exactly what you think it is, is dealing with the literal biological basis of behavior, right? So neuroscience, um, the study of the nervous system, especially the, the brain. We'll talk about some different uh, brain scans here in a little bit. Uh, psychodynamic is just Freud's new version of psychoanalytics. Um, and uh, what happens in this is, you know, the same thing that Freud did, except probably not as aggressive and sexual as his version. Um, so still looking at the unconscious mind. Behavioral perspective, again, really focusing on how we learn and how we modify and acquire behavior. Humanistic perspective, again, it is the perspective of psychology that deals with reaching your full potential. Positive psychology, um, again, this is a, a lot of psychology, specifically psychoanalytics, based in like negative um, things, what's wrong with you. Positive psychology actually hopes to foster the things that are um, going well for you. Uh, so certain things you could see in this would be flow state. So getting into a particular flow state where time doesn't really exist for you anymore because you're doing this thing that you love. Um, and uh, that is a good place to be in. That means that you're, um, you know, you're probably moving towards your full potential. But, uh, you know, if you can find something like that and make it your career, um, yeah, you're doing pretty good. Uh, so... Cognitive perspective, hopefully you know that the word cognition really does mean mental processes and thinking. The things that you could see here would be attention, language, memory, perception, problem solving, creativity, thinking in general. Um, you know, cognitive perspective, uh, we're, we're looking at how we think about things, our thoughts. Uh, cognitive neuroscience is the study of how we do that. So the actual processes we see in the brain um, they go along with that. For a long time, we couldn't do anything like this, but now we have these certain brain scans and brain imaging techniques that we can use to watch ourselves think in real time in response to stimuli, which is um, unbelievable for uh, the field of psychology. Um, this is just an example of what we would talk about in cognitive psychology. So uh, memory is a huge thing. Um, so yeah, uh, sensory memory, working memory, long-term memory, all huge parts of cognitive psychology. Um, kind of understand that, um, you know, 
the process of memory, just one more time for you, is sensory memory, all right, short-term memory. And then if we work with it, with our working memory, and we make it relevant to ourselves, we get it into this unlimited capacity place called long-term memory. Um, Cross-cultural cultural perspective, um, that's just studying psychology uh, across cultures, pretty easy to understand. I mean, they're gonna try to trick you up with two words, egocentrism and ethnocentrism. Um, ethnocentrism is judging people's cultures uh, against your own and probably thinking that yours is the best. I mean, we do that probably in the United States. Uh, individualistic cultures versus collectivistic cultures. Individualistic, guess what? Based on the individual and their individual's successes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the collectivistic culture based on the group uh, and the group's successes. Um, uh, da, 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 examples of cultural differences. Okay, evolutionary perspective of psychology, uh, the application of the principles of evolution like survival of the fittest, right? Natural selection to explain psychological processes and phenomena. So what happens here, honestly, Charles Darwin kicks this thing off with the origin of species and people start realizing that we have evolved to survive. And some of that has to deal with our psychological processes. Um, you know, almost, Everything genetically coming through us, you know, with our thoughts is survive, 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 you know, be a part of a group. Um, uh, you know, have empathy for others to understand what they're going through because you're going through the same thing, probably. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's all based in this, honestly. You know, we, we're all coming from these. Um, Again, I've said it a million times in this class. We're in a modern world with ancient systems. Okay? And we fight those ancient systems all the time to be a part of this modern world. Dunbar's number is a great example of uh, evolutionary psychology. So like, how many people can you really know in your life? Um, so, you know, that actually is correlated to the size of your frontal lobe. Um, so we have... Uh, very large frontal lobes and uh we can actually be and know uh about 150 people and what their relationship to us and the other people happen to be um that's what our you know brains can actually handle now some of you are probably like but i got 14,000 followers on instagram okay how many do you really know you know like, no, no. So if you whittled, whittled it down, it'd be close. It'd be close to this number, I promise. Um, all right, specialty areas. So this is like how people, so we have these perspectives. So how we view, right, psychology. And that's what we just went over. These specialty areas is how we work in psychology. So the biological perspective, again, you know, we're talking about actually working with the central nervous system. Um, you can see what we all truly are right there to the right. Uh, we are um, two eyeballs, a brain, uh, a spinal cord, and then nerves hanging off of that spinal cord. That is what we all are right there. Um, and uh, I like to think about that. I like to know that uh, about everything. Um, so, and then we have clinical psychology. This is working in the field of being a therapist, honestly. Um, so you, you know, Maybe you diagnose psychological disorders, you use psychotherapy techniques, uh, use psychological testing to find out if there's something wrong or something needs to be done. Um, that's what you do as a clinical psychologist. So you work in the field where you probably imagine psychology happening. Um, cognitive psychology, you investigate mental processes, including reasoning, thinking, problem solving, memory, perception, mental imagery, language. Um, uh, counseling psychology, you help people cope with personal and interpersonal problems. Uh, educational psychology, uh, you, you know, help people of all ages learn um, and develop the instructional methods, methods and materials used to train people in both educational and work settings. I mean, this is a pretty um, interesting field these days because you want people to be you know, mentally able to complete jobs and uh, some 
you know, occupations, corporations, whatever, actually pay people to do this for them. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what educational psychology is. Experimental psychology is running experiments about psychology. Pretty simple explanation of that. Uh, developmental psychology is studying uh, and watching people uh, change over the lifespan, not only phys you know, physically, but psychologically, um, socially. Uh, forensic psychology is that fun one um, where you um, would study if somebody was sane or not. You'd study serial killers. You would be, you know, um, see if somebody's fit to, you know, have custody of a child. Uh, jury selection, eyewitness testimony. Um, all of these things have, you know, you could be an uh, expert witness as a forensic psychologist. Uh, health psychology focuses on uh, prevention, treatment of illness, um, relationship between psychological factors and physical health. Um, so, you know, promoting and enhancing uh, healthy behaviors. Uh, industrial slash organizational psychology is work psychology. So this is kind of what we we're talking about a little earlier in like training psychology as well. So you might see this as I backslash O psychology. So this uh, specialty area includes job analysis, uh, personnel selection, training, worker productivity, job satisfaction, leadership, group behavior within organizations. I mean, a lot of high level corporations, you take a psychological exam and then all of a sudden they place you in the job that you fit best from that exam. That's how it kind of, you know, things are trending in that direction. Uh, personality psychology, studying, you know, personality factors. Um, so uh, just to cover this right here, type A and type B. Type A um, is going to do something. They're going to be a little bit, um, you know, they're going to get it done immediately, whatever that thing is. That's kind of a type A person. Type B person is like, I'll get it done when I get it done. All right. They're kind of like not rushed through things. Um, so that's just two examples there. Um, personality psychology is huge. It's a whole chapter for us. Um, rehabilitation psychology, um, so helping people with chronic and disabling health conditions like Alzheimer's or MS or whatever it is, get back to where they can, um, you know, hopefully not be, um, you know, their everyday life so disrupted by their particular problem. Social psychology, exactly what you think it is, um, you know, persuasion, obedience, conformity huge topics in social psychology, helping behavior, the bystander effect, all of that. Uh, sports psychology, what I would love to go into if I had a time machine, but I don't regret anything. Um, so uses psychological theory and knowledge to enhance athletic motivation, performance, and consistency. Um, I think about this stuff a lot. I try to help my baseball players with it as much as I possibly can. Because, uh, you know, in baseball, you fail a lot. And so you have to deal with failure. Clinical psychologist versus psychiatrist. What do we know here? We know that the psychiatrist can prescribe medicine. It's our big glaring difference. Um, all right, scientific method. I'm not going to go crazy about this, but um, there are definitely moments where you're going to see the scientific method on the AP exam. Um, so, you know, I think main things that we need to understand. Um, Okay, empirical evidence, so verifiable evidence that's based upon objective observation, measurement, and or experimentation. Okay, you've taken this in through your five senses and it's kind of concrete information. It's not subjective where you judge it and you have bias, it's objective where there is no bias. That's empirical evidence. Um, Um, so yeah, these are things you already know. Um, I think the one thing that you have to understand is operational definitions is actually just procedures. So the step-by-step -step layout of how things went during a, a particular psychological experiment, we don't call them procedures. We call them operational definitions in psychology. So that's something that you have to understand. Um, two methods of collecting data, uh, descriptive methods and experimental methods. So let's go through some descriptive methods here in a second. 
Um, I guess we, okay, in psychology, we use statistics. So we want to find out that things are statistically significant, meaning that, um, you know, it didn't happen by chance. That's what that would mean. Uh, so um, a meta analysis is kind of taking a bunch of different things and combining them, like a bunch of different studies and combining them to analyze the results of those studies without actually doing any studying or experiments yourself. This is used a lot. This is a lot of research about other things out there. Um, replication is so important in psychology. If it's not repeatable, then the findings aren't accurate. It's pretty easy to understand. Um, you know, if it can't be done over and over and over again in the same way and get the same type of results, then the findings of that experiment or that study are, you know, not reliable. Um, mm -mm -mm. There's some different emotional theories or theories of emotion. Um, all right, pseudoscience, false science. Um, so psychologists would not believe in astrology. And I tend to agree with them. Um, ah, the stars and planets don't have any effect on how I feel today. And I kind of agree with that. Um, but I'm kind of a internal locus of control guy. Um, I like to think that I have the joystick to my own life. Um, all right, so descriptive research methods. So we have naturalistic observation where we just watch something from a distance without being caught um, and study them uh, and their behaviors. Case studies are specifically made for pretty much um, I don't know, it, it, it's studying an individual or a small group of individuals. Um, you know, usually you're assigned a case manager and they have some sort of a social, um, you know, social work background or psychology background uh, and they take notes on you and they kind of understand where you are in life and if you're trending towards a psychological disorder or not. Surveys, I'm not explaining that to you. If you don't know what that is, um, you're a silly goose. And then um, correlational studies. Um, so looking at relationships and making predictions. So let's go to the, that real quick. Uh, correlational studies. Um, so these graphs that you're gonna see right here are called scatter plots. Um, so you might see some examples of those uh, on, on the AP exam. And um, know that there's different types of correlations here, right? So um, uh, a correlation is always gonna fall between the numbers of negative one and positive one. And the sign means a positive correlation, which means they're traveling in the same direction, either both going up or both going down. That would be a positive correlation. And then a negative correlation means that they're heading in opposite directions. So one's going down, one's going up right, or one's going up and one's going down. That's a negative correlation. Uh, zero correlation means that there is no rhyme or reason to what's going on there. And then there's this other thing, and I don't think it's actually listed here, um, you know, an uh, illusory uh, correlation. So where it's kind of like an illusion, it appears to be correlated, but it's not quite that way. Um, so you might see that term as well on uh, the AP exam. Uh, so here's some examples of uh, what type of correlation it is. As the temperature goes up, ice cream sales go up. That's a positive correlation. When workers get a raise, morale improves. That is a positive correlation. A student has many absences as a decrease in grades. That would be a negative correlation. As one exercises more, his body weight becomes less. Negative correlation. The longer amount of time you spend in the bath, the more wrinkly your skin becomes. That's a positive correlation. The more one eats, the less hunger one will have. That is a negative correlation. And the more kittens you have, the more your batting average in baseball will go up. That's a zero correlation. That doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, experimental method, just know the difference between independent variable and dependent variable. Independent variable um, is the factor right, that is 
purposely manipulated, okay? Also called the treatment variable. So um, the independent variable, um, probably in general, um, is gonna be like the drug given in the experiment. Uh, the dependent variable is what happens, all right? So the factor that is observed and measured for change. So if it was a drug administered, independent variable, so we would look at the behavior as the independent, I mean, the dependent variable dealing with the people who took the drug. What did, what happened to the people? Uh, the extraneous variables or confounding variables are anything we just didn't take account for during the experiment. So the great example here is like how you throw. Um, so, um, the dependent variable here, uh, the person's ability to throw a ball. Uh, the independent variable is how long it's been since they've eaten. And then everything that we didn't understand or didn't take account for would be uh, metabolism and weight of the individuals, ball size, age, time of year, location of the experiment, person providing the instructions, hand size, all that kind of stuff. We just wouldn't think about it. We didn't, you know, we didn't make that uh, uniform across the experiment. So we get weird results because of that. Uh, placebo is a fake substance. Placebo effect is, you know, having some sort of effect because you took a fake substance. You know, um, and this is real. That people can have a fake surgery and feel better, which is silly. Uh, random assignment is the process of assigning participants into either the experimental group or the control group. And they're randomly assigned so that there's no bias. Double blind techniques, that's the best way to do uh, experimental research where the experimenter doesn't know who gets the placebo and who gets the actual drug. And the people who, the subjects don't know either. So it's double blind, nobody knows. All right, single blind, the researchers do know, but the participants don't. Uh, demand characteristics, kind of how like, um, it's almost like the tone of voice that you would use in um, giving the instructions. It is important. Uh, practice effect is just the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. So you have to take that into account whenever you're doing an experiment. The main effect is any change that can be directly attributed to the independent or treatment variable. So, you know, start you do an experiment on Adderall and you can watch people's attention get better. That would be the main effect. Control group or control condition, those are the people who, um, you know, they don't, they get the placebo probably, you know, they, they don't, they're, they're the normal group. They don't get the independent variable. Uh, natural experiment, a study investigating the effects of naturally occurring events on the research and participants. All right, brain scans. We got a PET scan. Okay, so this is the only intrusive brain scan. So something is actually, um, you know, entered into the body, right? It's invasive. Uh, so they put some radioactive tag on sugar or, you know, your blood sugar or whatever, and they watch it flow through the brain using a machine called a PET scan, all right? Um, then we have magnetic resonance imaging and MRI. And this is honestly, you're just taking pictures of slices of the brain, all right? Then we have a functional MRI, so an fMRI. Um, and this, you know, non-invasive, nothing's going inside of your body. Um, but it uses magnetic fields to map brain activity by measuring changes in the brain's blood flow and oxygen levels. So this kind of follows the blood flow and oxygen levels around in the brain. And wherever the blood flow is, the brain is probably active. So, you know, that's what it does. It, it moves around blood to, to certain areas whenever it's more active in those certain areas. Um, Comparative psychology is studying uh, the behavior of different animal species. And um, you do have to know this kind of, and I think that you can use common sense for this, but uh, principles regulating research within human participants. So what, do the sub what are the rights of the subjects uh, in psychological experiments? Um, 
they have to be, they have to have consent. They give consent, okay? Um, students can be used as research uh, participants. Um, so it can be a course credit or earn extra credit. I mean, this is real, that happens in college. Uh, you can't use the use of deception unless it is needed and it has to be ethical. Uh, confidentiality of information, so you wouldn't release the names of any type of subject used in an experiment. And then you have to be debriefed as a uh, subject of the experiment. So, you know, you have to be, all right, this is what we were studying and this is what we found out. Um, you ha that has to happen. Um, otherwise, you know, you never know what it was truly about, specifically if they used deception. Um, all right. We did it. We're done with the review. Yay.